As we head into Ramadan, we're reminded about the importance of giving charity and helping the needy. Alongside fasting and praying, zakat and sadqah is an essential part of the month, enabling believers to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are many Muslim pioneers in the United Kingdom who over the decades have helped build our community here in the UK. And tonight we want to profile one of the UK's most prominent, hard-working humanitarian activists. He's a leader in his own right and a pioneer who we as a community owe so much to. Dr. Hane Al-Banna was born in Egypt. He graduated in Islamic studies and is a founder of the humanitarian charity Islamic Relief. He founded the Muslim Charities Forum where he's the chairman and he's also the president of the Humanitarian Forum. I'm pleased to say Dr. Hane Al-Banna is live on British Muslim TV from Birmingham. Dr. Hane, uh, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Great, warm welcome to the program. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Alaikum Assalamu Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Thank you so much. Well, let's come on. Let's talk about uh, your youth. You were born and grew up in Egypt. You studied Islamic studies. What was it like growing up in Egypt? Uh, in the 50s, it was a very conservative country, actually. And my family as a whole is conservative or was conservative. My father was a professor of Islamic law. My mother was a housewife and she was by nature a community leader. So the house was divided between the theology and the social work. And this is how I was brought up in the middle of one of the largest capitals of the world at that time. And how important was the deen to you, Islam to you, as you were growing up? Islam was a mission for my father and my mother and myself. It's not a religion. It's a mission, it is a lifetime mission for individuals. I've been brought up to believe that we are not just worshippers, but we are community workers, we are uh, believers, we are uh, problem solvers, we are helpers, and we are members of a smaller and larger society as well. And this is Islam for me. Islam is not something you practice in the mosque or in your room. Islam is a dimension of life which you can make the right positive change, not only for your community, but for humanity. We look at what's happening in Ukraine um, and we look at some Muslims think that we should ignore it and we should, you know, not help the needy people, the refugees who are fleeing Ukraine. What would you say in response to that? I'm very happy to say that we have five Muslim charities are working for Ukraine. Human Appeal, Muslim Hands, uh, Action for Humanity, uh, Human Relief Foundation, and Al Khair Foundation. Maulana Imam Qasim uh, arrived today to Poland or Ukraine, or not tomorrow. I'm very happy to celebrate these five uh, charities who are there, members of Muslim Charities Forum. Those people who say that, I don't think they understand Islam. Islam is about neighborhood. Right. Islam is about miskin. Islam is about yatim. Islam is about poverty, stricken people, and areas where actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never make a distinction between the people who are in need, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims. That's why those people have to review the understanding of the theology of Islam it's not right because Islam is something which we have in our hearts to help everybody and anybody. And the thing they are bringing or the teaching is wrong. Yeah, that's really important. Let's talk about that 0% policy. Lots of people think that charities should be given 100% of everything that they raise to the, um, you know, to, to the needy. What, what do you say in response as chairman uh, of the British Muslim Charity and uh, as a humanitarian yourself for so many decades. Tell us a bit about the 0% policy, please. There is nothing called 0% policy. It is a PR exercise. It's a fundraising tool. It's a, com and it's a competition between organizations. Let me take you to do things. If you say that 
zero percent policy organization, I will tell you how do you pay the salary and the expenses of your employees and other things. You might say I have a donor. I will tell you, declare that you have a donor. Because anything to come to you as a charity is a charity, even if it's an in-kind donation. This is number one. Number two, if you are using the uh, gift aid money to cover your actually expenses, this is deceiving because the gift aid is a donation from donors to you. So you have to declare it. This is regarding the 0% on the uh, actual charity. If you come and tell me 0% zakat, I will tell you why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that wal amilina alayha. If Allah decided to take a portion of zakat to the people who, first of all, collect zakat, actually make the case studies for the poor people who are eligible for zakat, then distribute zakat, then make the report, who's going to pay for them? If you say, I'm going to take it from another fund, it is not a 0% again. It's another issue of PR exercise to try to capture the market, which is not right. There's no transparency in this. The transparency is to say, I'm going to take a percentage mm. from the cat. Whether yeah. the donor like to pay for it or not, it's entirely um, up to him, uh, not up to me. Yeah, uh, uh, and so the public who are giving that charity should accept, no. the public should, should accept there isn't a 0% policy. That's what I'm asking. There's nothing. You know where you can get 0% policy, Brother Muhammad? Yeah. yeah. In heaven. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. When you go to heaven, the food comes, jump to your mouth. Your clothes will come for free. Okay. Your bed, your dwelling, everything will be for free. Not in, on earth. On earth, there's nothing called 0%. And in charity, you have to declare every donation we receive, even if it's for the admin cost, to be transparent. What inspired you, sir, to become a humanitarian? Uh, to be very honest, I have three stories in my life. In 1982, I just uh, passed my exam in 78 to become a medical doctor here. I'm a medical doctor, not, not, not a, a, a doctor of religion. Uh, I'm medical, uh, then I got a degree of... of uh, of Islamic study as well. And uh, I was, uh, during 1982, three things happened to me. First of all, uh, there was a, a Sabra and Sichina massacre in Lebanon, in Beirut, which was a wake-up call for me as a young doctor. This is number one. Number two, wake-up call is another massacre in a, a, a city in Syria called Hamat, where the conflict between the government and somebody there in the community, and thousands and thousands of people are being killed in this uh, conflict. The third one, on my way back from Cairo to uh, uh, London, I decided to visit uh, uh, a place in Europe where there's Muslim there to spend a few days on the way back. It was Yugoslavia at the time. It was not actually divided yet. So I went to visit Belgrade, to visit uh, Zagreb and to visit Sarajevo. And in Sarajevo, I discovered there's the Muslims that are living there in Bosnia. The Muslims have been tortured by the communists and the socialists at the time. And these three incidents were a wake-up call for me in 1982 to start shift from the medical career to think strongly into the humanitarian. 1983 was another turning point where the famine in Eritrea and Tigray happened in Ethiopia, in, the, in, in Ethiopia, and hundreds of thousands of people crossed the border of Eritrea and Tigray and came to Sudan, and this was the end of it. So three incidents in 1982, one incident in 1983, and here I'm, I'm totally driven to the humanitarian work. So, a really fascinating story. We're going to continue our conversation, Dr. Hani Albanna. Uh, who's a humanitarian pioneer here in the United Kingdom, but not just here in the UK, but around the world. Really powerful. I know you're going to stay with us um, as we head towards that break. Uh, a real sense, an opportunity for us as we head into Ramadan. The whole point of this uh, segment was to inspire you to understand the humanitarian charity sector, because lots of us um, find it uh, easy to criticise, easy to denigrate, easy to pass fake news 
easy to make life difficult and then forget that you're in the holy month of Ramadan. And uh, as I said at the top of the program, Dr. Hane uh, Albena is one of those pioneers. He came in this country, he helped. He could have had an easy life with a medical career, but he, he didn't. He stood up and helped us build the community we have and we're always grateful to him. So we're going to take a very quick break. When we come back, we'll continue the important conversation and talk to Dr. Hane Albana uh, further. Join us on the other side of these very important messages. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV, live from our studios here in Wakefield. We're going to open the lines and take your calls now on 01924-231-083. Get in touch with us on our social media handle, British Muslim TV. We've got an exclusive conversation with Dr. Hane Albanna. He's my special guest joining us live from Birmingham. Um, doctor, we before the break, we talked about inspiring and the zero percent. And I suppose my next question would be around succession planning. Allah give you a long life and may Allah preserve you so that you can continue your good work. But do we, does the charity sector think about succession planning and inspiring the next generation of leaders in the sector? Uh, whether they think or not, it has to be done. You can't afford, we can't afford to have the same individual like myself for 30 and 40 years. My limitation will be more because by the time I become older, I will not be able to respond to the community needs. I think it's very, unfortunately, most of our organization do not have a proper plan for succession planning. And once you are a chair, you'll be forever a chair. Once you are a president, you'll be forever a president. Once you are a CEO, sometimes you'll be present, uh, forever a CEO. This is a problem. And succession planning means that actually you have to keep training young people, whether they are male or female. Actually, the, male, the female absence from the senior leadership of Muslim charity is something actually questionable as well. This is something you have to get the, the mindset of the people who are running such a charity. So I think we have as chairman, or as presidents, or as CEO, to keep this kind of training of young people, young graduates, young uh, volunteers, as well as young officers, to be trained to become one day the chairman, the president, or the CEO, or the head of the division, or the head of the department. Otherwise, we'll be decaying organizations. What you can see nowadays is no proper planning of bringing younger generation to the organization. This from one point of view. The second point of view of succession planning, we should actually be more diversifying. Well, actually, we should not be called Asian organization. Some people were telling me that most of the charitable organizations in the UK are Asian charities. They are not just Islamic charities. We need to see the diversity of to become multinational, multiracial, multi-faith organization inside the Islamic charities as well. So succession planning is something vital and you can see it everywhere. I used to learn this when I was when I came here as a medical as a medical graduate. And when we used to be in the work round in the in, in the in the hospital, the professor or the consultant or the head of the, the department used to come and hold the young uh, student by hand and gave him or her to the sisters, to the nurse, to the uh, registrar, to the senior house officer, and telling them, you have to work and develop and train this young man and young woman. They knew that we have to be trained from the nurse, from the sister, from the uh, junior uh, uh, doctors, from the senior doctors, and from the consultant, and from the professor as well, to invest in me as the young graduate. We need to see this clearly happening inside Muslim charities, not to only see the same face 24-7. Alhamdulillah, 2008, it was my uh, last day, it was 8 April 2008, I have to step down from Islamic leave as a president and as a founder at the same time. And since that, I did not come back to Islamic leave worldwide again. 
Sometimes I give them advice, sometimes I travel with them, but I'm not a decision maker in the organization uh, at all in UK or worldwide. I was chairman, I'm trying to get out of Muslim Chairs Forum and we're discussing this for the last three years with the member of the board as well, because there's no point of me staying as a chairman of the Muslim Chairs Forum for 15 years or 12 years or 14 years. Alhamdulillah, we can choose somebody else from the committee and we are discussing this subject with one or two candidates who are eligible to become the new chairman. I hope that will be at the end of this year or maximum the beginning of the 2023, inshallah. Yeah, that's really important. And then when you look at some of the activities that charities do, for example, we, we you know, say come and sponsor this orphan child. What's the reality around uh, what part of, of that sponsorship should be asked for? Yeah. Uh, Brother Muhammad, uh, this is an open discussion and frank discussion and sometimes painful discussion. The Arabic word of kafala means full sponsorship. But kafala has a career, it talks about uh, Lady Mary, السلام, when she was living in the house of Prophet Zakaria. The word kafala in Arabic means treating her like his daughter. See, if you are Muhammad Shafiq, and your income is about 60, 70,000 pounds a year, you might end with a net income of about 40,000 pounds divided on you, your wife, or your two children with you after the tax, after the, the pay, 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 paying the bills and the electricity, and, and the, you might be left with about 20, 25,000 pounds to be divided on six, four shares for you and your wife, and two shares for actually your, your son and your daughter. The two shares, each of them will be three to four thousand pounds. That means be, be about three hundred pounds a year. Uh, sorry, uh, three hundred pounds a year. Uh, uh, no, uh, three hundred pounds a month. No, three hundred pounds a month, not a year. That means that this is kafala has a career. Hmm. Kafala has a career is you spend on your child every month about three hundred pounds. We were in this high level conference in uh, in in Istanbul, and one of the great mufti from uh, the Arab world, and they stopped me by saying hundred dollar a month. So you cannot put a ceiling for the kafala, the kafala or the sponsorship, because it's open ended. Like you treat the young girl or the young boy like your daughter or like your son. But when you say support a child, support means you can pay a dollar, you can pay a pound. You can pay five pence, you can pay 20 pence, you can pay 1,000 pounds. There's no limit, actually, for this. But when you talk, talk about kafala, which is sponsorship, it has an understanding of treating such an individual as much as you treat your own son and daughter. Unfortunately, nowadays, we find charities actually are marketing the children, are marketing the young boys and young girls as they are a pair of shoes or the trousers or the commodity, which is wrong. It's absolutely wrong. The word kafala is full sponsorship, treating the child as much as you treat your daughter and your son. But if you want to support, you can give any pen, any amount of money from five pence, 10 pence, one pound, two pound, whatever you want, because we don't want everybody. Somebody might not be able to pay the 300 or 400 pound a month. Okay, fine, they can pay five pound, they can pay two pound, but let's come to the understanding of the word kafala which mentioned in Arabic in Quran about Lady Mary alayhi salam. Yeah, really important. Thank you for that. Now tell us a bit more about the Muslim Charities Forum that you set up where, where you were still president. Uh, Muslim Charities Forum was a dream not only for Islamic Relief when I was the president of it or for Hanid Banna, but it was actually for all of us. It was a human appeal at the time, a Muslim Aid, a Muslim Hands, a Khair Foundation, uh, uh, Penny Appeal even was uh, some time with uh, was, 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 uh, uh, was, uh, Muslim Chairs Forum, uh, uh, Omar Welfare Trust was, was Muslim uh, Chairs Forum, uh, Reed Foundation, uh, Islamic Relief, and all those organizations, uh, Human Relief Foundation, as well as other, about 16 or 17 organizations with Muslim Chairs. It's to make a bridge between the Muslim Chairs. Before Muslim Chairs Forum, Muslim charities themselves did not sit down to talk to one another. There was a high level of suspicion between different charities, actually. But since we started this kind of uh, coalition or building up this platform, alhamdulillah, 
They are sitting with one another. They are talking to one another. They are thinking more for the community. Like, as I, as I told you earlier on, I was got five organizations, alhamdulillah, working for Ukraine. Inside Ukraine, led, the first one was there is Muslim Hands, actually. Uh, no, no, uh, yes, Muslim Hands from... Uh, from Nottingham, followed by others, which I mentioned them before. Actually, now even in Haiti, it was our direction during the 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 the, the, the earthquake in, in, in Haiti. Twenty-two organizations responded to Haiti uh, at that time, and some of them went there to distribute aid material to the people of Haiti. Even Islamically, at the time, built five schools funded by the Islamic Development Bank. I don't know why or there's a setback. In the case of Ukraine, which is, should not be the case, mm. Ukraine is, is actually at the backyard of Europe and the, if in Europe, and we should be the champion showing humanity how we care for the non-Muslims. Um, we've had a really good conversation. I hope we can continue this conversation after Ramadan. Maybe review uh, how charities have been uh, acting and, and responsibly in Ramadan. But when you reflect on your life, sir, and your public service, what are you most proud of? I'm most proud of the people who are carrying the whole work, actually uh, willingly, uh, uh, tirelessly, and actually the newer generation which is coming. Let me take you to a journey, uh, Brother Muhammad uh, uh, Shafiq. Uh, we started uh, uh, Islamic League, the Muslim Aid, the 80, 84 and 85. There was no Muslim charities, a humanitarian organization. But we started a humanitarian movement in 1984 in UK. Now there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of humanitarian organizations from the Islamic background, whether in UK or in Europe or in America. And this was the first step was 17th of January 1984 from Birmingham, from UK. We are very proud of this, Brother Muhammad. What we need to do now is to start to create social movement. What do you mean by social movement? Social movement, when we look at every individual inside the society in UK and outside UK, what does it mean? It means that we should look at the local programs, the elderly, the sick people, the homeless, the runaway girls and boys, mm -hmm. and all these local programs which we need to respond to it. It's more tiring than actually the humanitarian work. You know why, Brother Muhammad Shafiq? Because humanitarian work is emotional. I can make you cry to get the money out of your pocket. But when I talk about social work, I, do, I cannot make you cry. Very difficult to raise funds for local domestic program. Very easy to raise funds for humanitarian response. Okay. That's why most of Thank our organizations nowadays... Is... Yeah. Sorry, I'm cutting you off there, uh, Dr. Hani al -Banna. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I've really enjoyed our time together here on British Muslim TV. We wish you well for Ramadan to you and your family. That was the UK pioneer, Dr. Hane al Banna, the humanitarian activist, campaigner, leader, joining us live from Birmingham. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll head to Redbridge in London. Don't go anywhere. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi.